Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Now, today, we're going to be speaking with a business leader that is helping some of the world's largest and most successful organizations evolve, evolve far beyond their legacy systems and processes and do business and do business well in a brave new era of global supply chain. So stay tuned for what promises to be an intriguing, informative, and entertaining conversation. Uh, with that said, I'd like to introduce our guest here today. Our featured guest brings more than 25 years of expertise to the table, especially from a manufacturing, purchasing, and planning point of view. Our guest has been named one of the top women in global supply chain by supply and demand chain executive in 2018 and again in 2021. So I want to welcome in Christine Barnhart, Vice President of Product Strategy and Go-To Market for Verison. Christine, how are we doing? We're doing great. How are you doing? Fantastic. Uh, I tell you, your um, your ears may have been burning. Uh, members of our team, members of the Verison team, <laughs> members of the supply chain market have been talking about you a little bit. You know, as a redhead, it's hard to stay under under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, for as much as you know about global supply chain, uh, I love already our pre-show conversation. Seems like you bring a lot of personality and passion to the table. Um, yeah, I mean, I try. I, I I don't think I can do anything I don't love, quite frankly, <laughs> at least not for very long. So, yeah. I love that. So, on that note, before we get into the heavy lifting, let's talk about Christine Barnhart. Let's get to know you a little better. So, tell us, where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, Heavensville, if Evansville. you will. Evansville. Um, beauty of Evansville is we're less than three hours from Indy, St. Louis, Nashville, Cincinnati, about an hour and a half from Louisville. So um, definitely at the crossroads, if you will, um, of the United States. Okay. So growing up in Evansville, I think you're the first person I've ever met that grew up in Evansville. I've always, always seen... <laughs> Uh, it seems like they've got a regular team in the uh, March Madness. Uh, the University of Evansville, go Aces, okay. my, my alma mater. Okay, maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about um, growing up in Evansville. Um, give us some anecdotes. What, what, what made it special? Um, you know, I'm a true Gen Xer latchkey kid. So, um, you know, I'm in like the second grade going home from school by myself. I mean, it was that blue collar community, but very close knit. Um, you couldn't really get in trouble without your parents knowing because they knew like everybody in the neighborhood. Um, you know, I mean, just it was, it's a great place to, to raise a family. It's a little quiet. Um, which is why for me as an adult, I love that we're close enough to do, you know, weekend commutes to other places. But, um, you know, Evansville was a great place. I mean, we're right on the Ohio River, boating in the summer and, you know, things of that nature. So boating, uh, like skiing, fishing, what? Yeah, well, I mean, all of the above, um, a lot of, you know, it's a, um, the city, you know, is 175,000 in the city proper, about 500,000 in the greater metropolitan, but still a lot of agriculture, a lot of wooded areas. So, you know, fishing, hunting, I went, you know, like duck hunting with my dad when okay. I was eight years old, uh, actually on the Wabash, which is very close to us, the Wabash River. So um, a lot of outdoor activities. Um, a lot of sports. Sports huge in Southern Indiana. I played volleyball and softball. Um, my kids like really heavily involved in the lacrosse community, the soccer community. So um, you have to learn how to entertain yourself kind of in mid-America, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> All right. One more question. And I want to move on to uh, some of the things you did before joining the Verison team. So one of our favorite things to talk about here at Supply Chain Now is certainly food and, and local culinary uh, traditions and whatnot. 
So growing up in Evansville, Indiana, what was, uh, from a food standpoint, what was one thing you think about? Okay. So this is so redneck, but the, <laughs> the West side nut club fall festival, okay. huge kind of street fair. They close off several blocks on the West side of town, about 130 food vendors. Almost all of it is deep fried. If you can deep fry, even if you traditionally don't deep fry it, we deep fry it. Um, so it's not good for your cholesterol. It's not good for your, your blood pressure, your weight gain, your diabetes, anything of that nature. But it's once a year. That's, so that's okay. But it, is, it is. And you know, it's interesting. I went to Munich a few years ago and I true, I understood how this evolved. It's a very kind of Germanic, German Catholic kind of, you know, part of town. And it's like a tiny little Oktoberfest, complete with like bars and stuff along, you know, along the streets that have, you know, um, beer gardens and, and stuff that kind of complement it. So, Love it. yeah, I mean, you know, it's not like highbrow, but it's like what you look forward to that, that first week of October. I love it. it. It's real. It's authentic. It's, it's, it's human. And, uh, and my and birthday is in that period. So it's, it's like, you know, multiple <laughs> activities during the fall festival. <laughs> love it. All right. So we're gonna have to I'm marking on my calendar, <laughs> Evansville, Indiana, and the first week West, in October, mm -hmm. first week in October. And it was the West side nut festival. Nut club, Nut fall club. festival. Fall mm -hmm. festival. Okay. All right. All right. So I want to switch gears a bit. As much as I'd love to dive more into uh, the food dishes that I'm sure that can be found at the Nut Club Fall Festival, uh, I want to switch gears. I want to talk about, um, you know, the 25 years or so you've spent doing things, doing big things out in the industry. You need, to, um, you need to quit calling that 25 years out. You're making me feel very old. Well, you know, we've got a rule of thumb here and I almost applied it but I don't want to shortchange anybody. Greg White and I never go over 20 years. We can say 20 plus, but I didn't want, didn't want to shortchange anybody, you know, experience is important, especially during these challenging times. So uh, we don't, we're not gonna be able to do your journey. Uh, it's full justice, but talk about a couple of key roles prior to what you're doing now at Verison that really helped shape your worldview. Yeah, that's it's such a that's such a hard question for me, Scott, um, because I think I tend to divide my career into kind of two pieces. I have like the the first half, which was very engineering oriented. So multiple roles within Whirlpool, but all kind of with that traditional engineering tool set mindset. Right. Gotcha. Um, and, and then Whirlpool I will be in the, the, or the company that everybody knows appliances and, and you name yeah. it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I loved Whirlpool. I spent 12 years there. Um, about every two or three years, I was moving on, you know, to a, a more responsibility. Um, ultimately, I just, you know, like, I'm one of those people, I get bored kind of easily, I have to be moving, you right. know. Um, and when you reach a certain point in engineering, like the next, you know, engineering thing, they're like, oh, you don't have to work with anybody. You don't have a team. And I'm like, Ugh, like this, I don't, I don't know that I want to do this. So, right. um, complete career change. Um, and that was when I really discovered supply chain up until about 2008, I didn't know that what supply chain was or that okay. even manufacturing was part of the traditional definition of supply chain. So I think for me, in terms of a career journey, it's really marked by those kind of two pieces. Um, and and you just know, to clarify, know, Christine, kind of what I'm hearing, just to make sure we're on the same page, kind of pre-2008, when it was mainly engineering and manufacturing, and then post-2008, where you had your, maybe your global supply chain epiphany. Is that accurate? It, Yes, 100%. Um, moved into a, a planning role with Me Johnson Nutrition. Um, and it, what was great about it, Scott, is you don't quit being an engineer. Um, so I still had that mindset. I still solved problems that way. And I, I understood complex processes. And I could apply that but just in, in a different way to help the business. And um, it's really served me well since then. Um, and then I think for me then that kind of big change going from manufacturing to technology, which is what I did about three, three and a half years ago um, when I left Berry Global and, and went to, to Infor um, as an industry strategist. So, I mean, there's multiple roles in through there, but I think it was really more the companies and then just the great support that I got to grow and develop within multiple industries 
um, that has really helped me not just be successful, but be happy, right? right? Like, you know, just really be energized and, and have, you know, a lot of passion for what I do. I love it. And, and kind of fulfillment as well, right? Being fulfilled yes, yes, and rewarding. All right. One last follow-up question. Then we're going to talk about what you're doing now uh, and what Verison, who has been on the move uh, for sure. Um, you mentioned you, you're, um, you'll always be an engineer, which I think is a really cool thing, right? I am not an engineer. I, I could not <laughs> math and advanced math was not for me and that's okay. Um, so if there's one thing though, that your average non-engineer might take and apply when it comes to problem solving or getting through a day, if there's just one thing that you wish you saw more of, what would that be, Christine? Ask questions over and over and over and don't ever be completely satisfied that there's only one answer because generally there's not. I love that. Uh, and, if you don't ask questions, you're typically making assumptions. And most assumptions, I think, are probably inaccurate. We know, like, we know, we know that idiom, right? <laughs> right. You <and> me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let's talk about your current role uh, at Verison. Again, Vice President of Product Strategy and Go-To Market for Verison. Tell us more. Let's, let's start with maybe, let's flip the script. What does Verison do in a nutshell? Um, we are a supply chain intelligence platform, um, so really taking the data that you have today um, that often is in multiple systems, it's not harmonized, it's disparate, and helping you through AI and machine learning actually glean insights out of that data. Um, we've really you know, started focused on the MRO side of the equation, um, and now we're moving into direct materials, which is a big part of the reason that um, I came to, to Verison, you know, now, because I, I've been associated with the company for probably close to three years um, as part of some kind of industry um, sharing when right. I was in for and, and loved the premise of the company, but really needed it to, to kind of grow a, a bit before my skill set was really appropriate. Yeah, uh, well said. The material truth is one of my favorite phrases when folks yeah. from Verison join us. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that's the state we live in, right? Everyone's got their own spreadsheet uh, and these days their own system, different platform, yeah. different layers and stuff. And yeah. we can't move fast enough if yeah. everyone's using a different set of numbers, right? So that alignment yeah. for organizational velocity is critical. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of taking what you created, which was probably not a data lake, a data swamp, um, and really making it more useful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm slow to the, to the game or to, to um, uh, sometimes I'm the last person to know. I love data swamp because I've heard <laughs> data lake a thousand, a million times and data swamp is probably in reality. Oftentimes. I, I can't take credit. Um, Laura Ciceri, she, <laughs> she used that and I'm like, oh my God, I'm stealing this from her. So, oh, okay. Kudos, Laura. Uh, <laughs> good deal. Um, all right. So let's talk about now what you're going to be doing. It sounds like to me, um, you know, you'd already in, on some level and some measure been, had been collaborating and had relationships of Verison. So while it's a new role, a lot of the relationships and, and, um, and challenges perhaps are, it's, a, it's the same old game. So what are you going to be doing on uh, the Verison team? Yeah, I mean, I think my role is really to help the various teams and functions within Verison speak each other's language, which I'll tell you is a common thread throughout my career because development and product management and sales and marketing and customers, they all speak um, different languages and they, you know, how you say something matters. You can have a great product, but if people don't understand what it is, they don't know that they need it and they don't know why they need it. And so I think for me, that's a, a big part of what I bring. I think I also you know, it's really helping bring kind of the industry. Like I've lived, hey, I've been in maintenance. I've been in production and operations. I've designed products, right? And so I can say, eh, it's not really how people do that. Let's, <laughs> let's think about that differently. You know, that kind of thing. So love it. Yeah. All right. Uh, and one last thing is, is you mentioned harmonization earlier, and that's one of my favorite words. <laughs> it just kind of brings a great visual. Uh, and I swear there's got to be, a commercial there for data harmony, kind of along the lines of the famous yeah. iconic Coca-Cola commercial in the seventies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, we got to jump on that and make that happen. Okay. okay. Data 
harmony. I, and I'm not, I'm going to save all of our listeners and not sing it because uh, I am not known for, for, for my singing exploits. I can't okay. sing either, so I'm going to leave it there too. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's, um, you know, the state of global industry is such a big, uh, we'd be here all, all month uh, if we had to, you know, really peel all the layers of the onion back. Let's just talk when it comes to the state of global industry and kind of the current state, what we're seeing right now, what's a couple of things uh, that you're really tracking maybe more than others? I think first and foremost, I love that supply chain is now like part of the vernacular, right? Like people, my family finally understands at least sort of what I do. They're like, yeah, I couldn't find any toilet paper, or, you know, things of that nature. So I think that that's, that's actually a really positive thing. I think as painful as it's been to live through the pandemic, there's some really positive things from a supply chain standpoint. And part of it is just putting a mirror up to us and letting us, you know, we, we, we were having disruptions, people were chasing demand and we had these, what we thought were isolated problems. And what COVID has really shown us is we need to be much more intentional in how we design our supply chains, plural, um, because every company has multiples. It's not one size fits all. We have to be much, much more intentional about it. And by the way, they're constantly changing. Um, so I loved it a couple of weeks ago um, on one of your podcasts when Laura Ciceri was talking about like what 20% of companies are ac actively designing their supply right. chains. So I think that that's part of it. I think the other part is that it's really shown us that we have to have much, much better, more meaningful communication with our trading partners. You know, the, the multi-enterprise business networks or supply chain operating networks or whatever you want to call them, digital supply networks, there's multiple names. They've been around for a while, but they were not they weren't really being leveraged fully. They weren't being adopted across multiple industries. And I will tell you what I saw is that companies that were collaborating with their customers and collaborating with their suppliers and their carriers, they did better. And, and I think we need to see more and more of that as, as we kind of go into the future. And then I think the third part of what I've seen in global supply chains is people are finally recognizing that ERP isn't enough, right? Mm -hmm. ERP is great. You need that system of record. There's definitely business processes um, that are best suited to ERP, but finding an expert in an area where you have a problem um, is really beneficial to your business. You don't have to have all like subject matter experts for everything that you do. You can supplement your workforce with people like us, right? We right. understand materials and MRO and direct materials, and we can help you attack that area um, and there's somebody else that maybe can help you on the freight visibility side, right? So I think I think that's been um, one of the really great great outputs is people are just they're they're more open to having those discussions. Yep. All right. So two couple things I heard there. We'll, start, we'll go backwards on that last point. Is practical context, and it's like if you're talking global business, it's not one piece of context you you would truly need. You would need all types of context and, oh, and, and you're really, yeah, your ERP is not enough because it oftentimes it doesn't have the, right. the type of uh, practical context. So many okay. unique companies right. need, yeah. Yeah. and then going further back to your second point, you know, what you all but implied was how, how much more trust we need. Right. And I think what we can do is use that communication very deliberately, transparent, effective, timely communication to build trust, meaningful trust across your supply chain. And then as we all know, trust, once you've got it, you can move mountains. And that's, right. that's where we are right now in global it's supply 100%. chain. <laughs> I mean, the other caveat I think to that, Scott, is it is trust, but it's also just the data. Um, like 80% of the data that you need to operate your business doesn't reside in your business. Right. So if you're not effectively communicating and collaborating with your trading partners, you're sub-optimizing. Yep. <laughs> Excellent point. Love your perspective there. So practical. So been there, done that. I want to shift gears though. Uh, so the White House, President Biden has recently announced, Christine, that uh, they've got a new action plan to help move goods, right? Um, a lot of the new activity, I think it centers on about $17 billion in ports funding. And, but in particular, they're going to take action over the next, say, 35 days or so, I think to award a little over $240 million in new contracts. 
uh, maybe related to ports and 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 our infrastructure uh, for for supply chain. So what what's some of your takeaways there? I think it's a great start. I don't think it's um, everything that we need to do. I think, you know, I was in Long Beach last week, you know, just getting goods off of the ship doesn't actually get it into the country where people live and, and distribute it. So I think there's a lot more that needs to happen. I think, you know, we as a country need to look at how are our ports configured? Does it make more sense to have maybe rapid transit away from the port to more inland distribution, you know, kind of pickup areas? So I think there's definitely, you know, more, but I'm super excited that, you know, we have funding to at least start to make those investments. Good point. Uh, funding. Hey, at least it's, 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 uh, being talked about at the executive levels uh, across the globe. Yeah. And you make a great point. It's not all about uh, getting the containers off the ships. You know, we've, we've heard of, of 25 miles of train uh, backup coming into, you know, key, key uh, yeah. hubs uh, far inland. So right. it's a holistic well, and, ecosystem, right? And then I hear constantly, we have a truck driver shortage. I will tell you, we have a retention problem. Right. And I think we need to look at solving the retention issue, you know, the, the working conditions, how they're, they're paid and incentivized, the type of facilities that we would expect, um, you know, truck drivers to have access to. Um, and, and, and a lot of that also relates to attracting more minorities and females you know, into um, freight movement and, and trucking. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Agreed. All right. That's a great segue into what I want to uh, pick your brain about next. Uh, so first off, congratulations again for being named, you know, one of the top women in a really global supply chain. Uh, that's quite an honor twice, no less. Um, you know, some of the feedback we, we've heard is, hey, I want to be known as as one of the top supply chain practitioners, not top women. And then I, I hear on the other side, well, it's important to to highlight the fact that these are women movers and shakers making stuff happen. Um, the good thing is, is these conversations are taking place, right? As <clears throat> practitioners and leaders and organizations, it feels like, it seems like with some results are trying uh, far harder and more creatively than what we've seen in decades past. To, to your point, uh, really uh, 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 take hold of the opportunity that is bringing much more diversity to uh, not just global business or not just global supply chain, but global business. So I want to get your thoughts around this. So first off, when, it when we talk about the need for more diversity in global supply chain, let's first, for folks that may not um, do it because it's the right thing to do. Talk to about the bottom line impact it can have, that more diversity can have, Christine. There are just numerous studies that show that when you have a more diverse leadership team, because I don't think we can just say workforce. I think it's it's leaders, right? When you have more diversity in your leadership team, you are more creative, you solve problems better, and it absolutely impacts the bottom line, 20, 30 percent, mm. um, you know, kind of, you know, over a, a swath, a very large swath <laughs> of different industries and businesses. So it's it's almost impossible to argue with the data, but I think you have to look a little deeper because it's not just gender diversity. It's not just, you know, maybe identity or orientation diversity. I think they have to be really intentional to make sure that it's, you know, diversity of race, yes, diversity of gender, but also diversity of background and diversity of education and, you know, diversity of, of your cultural influences, because all of that really matters. The more diverse the team is, the higher the probability that they're going to have different kinds of ideals that will feed off of each other and allow you to solve a problem much more creative, creating. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, that's such a great point because while study after study that, that you allude to uh, that we've seen out there uh, from the big four to other think tanks and, and uh, other organizations that have done it uh, for themselves based on, on their own initiatives, uh, plenty of bottom line uh, and trackable bottom line impact. But to your point, some of the things that aren't as easily tracked is how we do solve problems differently that may never, you know, be captured by some of our metrics, uh, how we how, perhaps how we develop products differently. Right. 
Um, yeah. There's so much more beyond the bottom line, but also with the bottom line, that better diversity in all its forms as the point you're making can bring to organizations, right? Yeah. I mean, and I, I truly am a believer that supply chain can make the world better. And I think how we do that is by really embracing multiple generations, multiple genders, multiple, you know, orientations and ethnicities, right. because then we have multiple perspectives represented and, and we can really, I think, make step change, you know, step function changes in, you know, how we design products and how we move materials and all of those things moving forward. I love it. Okay. Completely agree with you there. Let's talk about, you mentioned when we broached the topic of diversity, you talked about especially leadership teams and, and you know, um, what I've seen a lot of data on lately is, you know, when, when, when you can look at supply chain, there's a lot of diversity that enters, but then as you go up into, you know, from fr uh, frontline and entry level to the, man the next managerial level, and then eventually up into the C-suite, that's when the disparity really um, becomes yeah. so, so, so much bigger and, and, and with it, the opportunity. So speak to a little bit, where, where do you see some of the biggest opportunities for diversity? I think we've seen some inroads, which I'm, I'm very happy for, but especially in technical companies, manufacturing companies, I think we need to be a little bit more prescriptive. We want to, we want women in leadership, but we don't want them siloed just in HR and marketing. You know, you, right. you want them, you know, in supply chain, maybe the chief supply chain officer, the chief development officer, or whatever. Um, so I, I will tell you, I have a little bit myself, a personal bias when I, when I'm looking at companies that I might want to join, I'm like, well, are the only women that they have kind of in these two functions? And mm -hmm. then based on the company, how much power do these, do they really have, right? In, in terms of the culture and kind of shaping where things go. So I, I do think we need to be a, a little bit more prescriptive. You know, we want diversity in the C-suite. We want it across multiple functions, multiple areas. Yeah, great call out there. Um, so, let, and, and by the way, uh, to your last point you made, folks, if you're looking to hire talent, uh, and, and, and as everyone's trying to really pick apart to build the best talent attraction equation, mm -hmm. you got to really take to heart what Christine just shared. Folks are looking, folks are observing, they're seeing yeah. where, um, where, um, where the leaders and the true, maybe the true home of power is within organizations. That's a great call out, Christine. All right. So now one of my favorite questions to ask all of our guests is, uh, you know, consider Christine, you've got. A captive audience. Let me paint a picture. You're at the Ritz Carlton up in uh, New York City, and you're, you're, you've got their finest um, event room, and you're you're the keynote. You're the star of the show, and and in that room, you've got a thousand captive audience members that are either in school or maybe they're new to industry, and they're really trying to figure out from someone that's been there and done it how can they get into executive leadership roles, especially in supply chain. Any advice? I don't think there is a single journey. I think that it's really about more of a mindset than it is a particular educational route or, or even an experience route. People that I see that, that do well in leadership are people that are continuous learners. They're innovative. They're not afraid of, of experimenting and they're constantly growing and learning and, and trying to, to really you know, push their business forward. So I don't think there's a single path. I think there's multiple paths, which I think is exciting. I mean, that ensures that you know we have multiple perspectives and I don't want everybody in supply chain to be an engineer. I don't want everybody <laughs> in supply chain to, to, to be business supply chain oriented. I think we need that mix um, because it's different mindsets, different skill sets. I don't need everybody to be good at math. I need some people to be really good at communication and right. those type of things. So I don't think that there's one path, but I do think 
it's growth. It's, it's really, you know, if you look at me, I guess I have an undergrad in electrical engineering, but then I supplemented that over the, I did, you know, advanced project management. I'm certified in project management. I did six Sigma black belt and, you know, I did, um, APICS, ASCM, you know, certified in production and inventory management. I did all those things. And then I got to a level in the company that I needed, really to understand more of the finance and business con- context. And I went and did, you know, a weekend executive MBA. That was challenging. I was just over 40. I had two young kids, wow. but it was it was the right time for me to, to grow and accelerate. If I would have done that MBA right out of college, I don't know that I would have gotten as much value from it um, because I was able to ask questions, challenge my professors to, you know, it was more of a three-way learning triangle versus that kind of two-way, right? It was me learning from peers, me learning from professors, you know, the, that kind of thing. So I think it's just that continual growth, you know, getting, get, just getting dirty and digging in, <laughs> you know, right. trying to figure out a better way. I love it. And, and, you know, one of, in, in part of your answer you talked about timing, you know, it seems like to me, generally speaking, there's such a rush to get every degree and certification and, and, um, you know, other learning experience without perhaps at least often often is a case without understanding kind of what you want to do and then working backwards to make sure you get the right ones. So to your point, you don't waste that critical time that no one has enough of and the resources and, 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 you know, the money it goes along with investing in yourself but that right timing and understanding how, you know, what's the right program and then how are you going to apply it and what's that return going to be like? Sounds like that was a regular part of your thinking there. You know, it was. And I I also think I I actually feel really bad for the millennials. It was starting with Gen X and then, you know, the millennials and and now Gen Z, we've sold them on this idea that everybody's got to go to college. It's the only path to success. And I look at some of my mentors when I was starting out, Um, at Whirlpool, many of them, yes, they had degrees when I met them, but they, that's not where they started. They started out in an apprenticeship or they started out in the military or they did these things that helped them mature and grow and kind of figure out what they like to do and what they were good at before they ever went and got a college degree. And so I think that we really, especially in the United States, we have to re-examine the model um, and, and the talent. Um, and, and I think there are there's a ton of opportunity to start to nurture at the high school level, you know, specialization. You know what? You want a program. You're really good with computers. Let's start getting you that training now. Not right. everybody needs a liberal arts education and not, you know, it's, I just I feel like we need it's like it's time. Right. We know that. We have a shortage, a labor shortage in the United States. It's it's really time to kind of own up to the fact that it's not one size fits all and that we have saddled an entire generation with debt that is not proving to, to, to be an obstacle that they can very easily overcome. Yeah, well said. Uh, it's time for a next generation approach, certainly yeah, to how we equipped. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, all right. So as we start to wrap up, I know you've got... Um, you know, by the time our conversation here publishes, you will have been to a big, I think a big event, big trade show conference. We'll have to uh, debrief you next time when you get back. Um, so Verison's on the move. They're folks that, by the way, um, you know, they're, they're hiring left and right. And, yeah. and clearly with Christine, folks like Christine, they're hiring top talent. Uh, so be sure to check them out and check out the website. But Christine, uh, given your journey, and I love you, you said everyone's on the same journey. That's such a, a great truth from this interview. Um, you know, where you've been, some of the biggest, most recognizable uh, companies on the planet to a team that um, uh, is on the move. New headquarters, I think, is where you're, you're, I'm talking to you from here today. What's Midtown, most, Midtown Atlanta. In Midtown <laughs> ATL, that's right. What, um, and before we close, before I make sure folks know how to connect with you, if you had to pick one thing that most excites you about um, where Verison is, where they're headed, what they're doing to change how supply chain happens and takes place uh, in 2021 and beyond. What's one thing that really excites you the most about uh, what you're doing now? You know, I think that it's, 
what I've learned since I've been here is it doesn't have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. We have the tools, we have the technology, companies have the data. It's just applying the tools and the technology to make the data useful. And, you know, it doesn't take, you know, a, a team of 20 people a year to implement something that you can then start to get value on. I think that, you know, selectively partnering and, and leveraging technology, there's a beauty in that. And we can solve problems. We can solve problems quickly. And I, I'm just, I'm super excited about that because look, I've lived through right? Like the big ERP implementations, right. you know, it was two years, over a hundred million dollars you know, invested, <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying it wasn't valuable because it was right. right. It was valuable, but it, it, it solved, you know, part of the problem. It didn't solve all the problems and it sure didn't help make the supply chain agile and resilient, right? It, it gave us a foundation. I think foundation is critically important. I, I don't want to see us throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we have to start to embrace, you know, micro applications, edge technologies to really take that move forward. Excellent point. Folks, you got to find a trusted resource for harmony and velocity and a lot more stability in the undoubtedly a lot more curve, curve balls that are headed our way in global supply chain in 2022 and beyond. Okay. Christine, you're as advertised. As I mentioned, uh, your ears have been burning. I've heard a lot about you and your journey here. I'm so glad that we had finally a chance to sit down and get to know you a lot better. Let's make sure folks know how to connect with you. So, Christine, what's the easiest way? I think the easiest way is probably on LinkedIn. So just type in Christine Barnhart. I'm the only one generally that comes up. I'm definitely the only redhead. So <laughs> you should be able to find me. Um, or you can actually get to us on Barrison.com as well. So, you know, either is a is a great is a great way to to get in touch. And I know I fit in in this org because everybody is generous with their time and they they're they're motivated by the right mission, which is I want to make it better. I want to make it easier. So I think all of us are always open to a conversation or communication and um, whatever we can do to help. We definitely will. Love it. And they love to compare notes. They love just to have the conversation. Hey, because uh, yeah. they love what they do. And, and hey, they're big. Uh, and I say this with all. Uh, love and affection. They're big supply chain nerds like we are here, right? We love to talk about what's going on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So folks, be sure to check out and we're gonna make it easy, right? You're gonna be able to connect with Christine and the Verison team one click away. If you check out the show notes of this episode, um, team on the move, Christine Barnhart, really a, a pleasure to get to know you here today and share some of your observations with our audience. It, the pleasure is all mine. I appreciate you inviting me on. And I always love to talk about this kind of stuff. So thank you. <laughs> we'll have you back soon. Uh, Christine okay. Barnhart, Vice President of Product Strategy and Go-To Market for Veris. And also the pride of Evansville or Heavensville, uh, Indiana. So we'll have to learn a lot more about that in uh, the months to come. Okay, folks, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Uh, Christine's a pleasure to chat through. and. She strikes me as someone who kind of tells it like it is. So we need a lot more of that in, in leadership, uh, global leadership these days. Uh, but hey, for now, be sure to check us out at supplychainnow.com for more episodes and conversations just like this. But most importantly, hey, we want to challenge you uh, and all of our listeners and our team to do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you right back here next time at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.